Praise the Lord. We'd like to welcome the nine o'clock crowd. I just want to remind you, it is 11 o'clock. If you missed the service this morning because of the time change, I'm just having fun with you. Welcome everyone on the line today. We trust that you will uh, participate with us and and listening and what God has to say today. Uh, I have been a busy interim pastor down at Selbyville. I have spent 28 weeks down there and uh, we still have a little more time left. I I think they're getting closer to finding someone to candidate the been uh, having a hard time getting candidates. There's only so many candidates in the district. And uh, so anyways, uh, I'm helping them out till they get that. I, 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 actually, <laughs> I actually was offered a, from a Baptist church to be an intern pastor. You know, <laughs> can he be our intern pastor till we find somebody? So apparently there's a shortage of pastors. And, uh, but it's an honor to be here. This is my home church. This is where uh, we grew our family. So. Praise the Lord. It's always great to be back in, at, at Calvary. Let me assure you that completely. And I do come off and on when they have speakers and things like that. I want to talk today about a subject that I, I trust uh, you will understand that there's so much more we could say. Uh, it could become a series, and, but it's a good start to think about something to get you going uh, renewed, kind of renewed a little bit today. We're trusting The title of the message today is Going Along or Growing. This title was birthed from a mindset that feels sometimes and says sometimes, um, okay, I'm saved and uh, I'm ready, so what? And uh, uh, here's the concern with the word so. The concern is, What are we settling for? In other words, if I'm not growing in the Lord on a regular basis, because God's unlimited, then what am I happen to be settling for? What am I not letting happen in my life? Or seems to be impossible to happen? Because it was never, ever, ever, ever God's intention that we be ordinary Christians. But rather than that we be extraordinary Christians. I think the ordinary Christian is the so-so walk versus the growing, uh, victorious, outgoing, explosive walk with the Lord. And, and of course, the question is, is that possible, Pastor? I want to assure you, I think it is. This morning, I felt led of the Lord to add a course of scripture, so it's not in your outline uh, to be seen on the screen, but I felt led to the Lord to bring this to our attention because it's, it's going to show the, the grow side of our walk rather than the so-so walk. We just going along as it is, you know, cruising along, idling along, as opposed to really going out there, really growing in the Lord. And can I recognize the difference even? So write this down, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 11. And I'm going to read this to you. And you listen, because I'm going to put you to work. I'm going to have you speak back to me, okay? So we're going to go through this. I'm going to have you speak back to me. Because sometimes when we highlight certain words, when we walk out of here today, sometimes some of those words are going to stand out in our thinking because we're going to be going through something this week. And we're going to remember, oh my goodness, that, yeah, that was a... I remember that word. Sometimes focusing on a word helps us to remember. Okay, so make a snapshot in your mind of of these things we're going to share together. So 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 11. And I'm going to read it from the Amplified because the the description is so beautiful and so clear as to what he's saying here. Okay, so here we go. For his divine power has bestowed on us absolutely, say absolutely, absolutely. That's how we're going to participate through here. So get ready. Absolutely every necessary, everything, everything necessary for a dynamic spiritual. Say dynamic spiritual. For a dynamic spiritual life and godliness. Now, does that sound like a going along just so-so? Or does that sound like something pretty energetic, pretty enlivening? You see already the difference. 
You'll see that here. So here we go. For his divine power has bestowed on us absolutely everything necessary for a dynamic spiritual life and godliness through true and personal knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has bestowed on us his precious and magnificent, say magnificent, magnificent promises of inexpressible value. Say value. His promises are valuable. His promises make the difference for us. That's what's going to make a difference in our walk, are his promises. So that by them, you may escape from the immoral freedom that is in the world because of disreputable desire and become sharers of the divine nature. Now, the NIV says, so that you might participate, say participate, that you might participate in the divine nature of Christ. All right? For this very reason, there's your connection. In exercising, say it with me, exercising, exercising your faith. So when we walk out of here, it's not, none of this going along so-so business. We're talking about exercising our faith. Two, develop moral excellence and in moral excellence, knowledge. Now, I'm going to stop right here. There's about five things that we're going to have to develop here. And in fact, if you look at the NIV, it will say an add to your, add to. So the word add is being used here in the NIV. So develop moral excellence and in moral excellence, knowledge, insight and understanding. That's what that means. And in your knowledge, self-control and in your self-control, steadfastness and in your steadfastness, godliness and in your godliness, brotherly affection, and in your brotherly affection, develop Christian love. Say love, all right? That is, learn to unselfishly seek the best for others and to do things for their benefit. Now, and every one of those four or five things, add was inferred. Add this, add that. So that, you know what add means? Add means multiplication. You know, when you add something to the spiritual realm, we are now on the, if we're doing it, say if, if we're doing it, we are now growing instead of just going along in a so-so attitude with our walk. You, you, have you ever had the feeling that when you got saved, you wondered, isn't there more to this? Sure. But we have to grow to know there's more than what we may have already experienced, whatever. All right, for as these qualities that we just read are yours, and listen to this, and are increasing, the, the NIV says, with increasing measure, increasing. You know what that means? This isn't just a fun thing to be reading. This is the Christian's life. This is the way it's supposed to be. We're supposed to be increasing in you as you grow toward spiritual maturity. Well, that's important. They will keep, say it with me, they will keep you from being useless and unproductive in regard to the true knowledge and greater understanding of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, if we keep adding to our lives and keep doing these things in our lives that we read here, go home and read it again, and add these to your life, they're going to increase you. The, with, with, when you do this with, with uh, increasing measure, they will increase you. They will help you to grow toward spiritual maturity. So there's something to grow toward, being more spiritual, being more mature. All right? For, what, for whoever lacks these qualities that we read, so there's a price to be paid when we don't, Guess what? They will keep us from being. It will, it, well, let me reread it this way. For whoever lacks these qualities is blind. Now, I've prayed for a long, long time. Lord, take the blind, take the blinders off the unsinner's life. Take the blinders off people's eyes. And then the Lord spoke to me months ago. 
And he, in essence, said, what about our blindness as Christians? We can be blind, too, if we're not careful. I always pray now, Lord, take the blinders off the unsaved eyes, but take any blinders off my eyes, Lord, if they're there. Listen to this. For whoever lacks this growth, whoever lacks, lacks in this process, causes a spiritual blindness. We're missing out. Short-sighted, closing his spiritual eyes to the truth. Ladies and gentlemen, we will never grow any further than we are right now if we close our eyes to this truth. This is the one that matters. This is the truth that matters. Amen? Amen. Haven't become oblivious to the fact that he was cleansed from his old sins. I don't want to be oblivious to what God did. I don't want to take for granted for what God did. I want the new. I want the fresh. I want the more that God has for me. Therefore, believers, be all the more diligent. Say diligent. Diligent. Say with some conviction. Diligent. To make certain about his calling and choosing you, be sure that your behavior reflects and confirms your relationship with God. My behavior. So when I go out of this place today, my behavior is going to either reflect God or something else that may not be good. I want to reflect God. For by doing these things, actively developing these virtues, that's ongoing. That ain't no no so-so walk. That's not just going along, coasting along. This is some work. This is getting involved with God. This is getting involved with his word. (laughs) You will never stumble. You will never stumble in your spiritual growth and will live a life that leads others away from sin. Doesn't mean we won't have challenges. That's not what it said. It says we won't stumble. That means something is there that could make us stumble. But it can keep us from stumbling if we will grow, if we will go beyond the so so walk. They're just going on and I'm saved. So I'm saved. I'm ready. What I got to worry about? Well, for in this way, entry into the kingdom, eternal kingdom of the Lord, Savior Jesus Christ, will be abundantly provided for you. Look at this. Live a life that keeps you from. Stumbling and can lead others away from sin. I want that kind of walk with God in my life. So uh, here's something I want to share that, again, it was never God's intention that we stay the same status quo. That was never God's intention. Uh, the, the only satisfaction that we should have is a dissatisfied satisfaction. In other words, be satisfied with the satisfaction you have when there's so much more that God wants us to experience and have. Our, our quiz coach in Michigan, I was on the Bible quiz team for competition with the churches in Michigan. We had a good team. We took second in the state of Michigan. We missed it by one question. Uh, we knew the answer, but the other team hit their buzzer at first, stood up and gave the answer, and they won it by one question. We would have won it and been state champions. And, uh, but we were second, and it was an honor to do this. And our coach was a prof- studying to be a professor at Michigan State University, and she went on to be a professor in Pennsylvania. But she went to our church. She was a believer, and she took us in, the young people, and she t- taught us the words. In other words, we, she was our coach. And she made a comment, and I remember it to this day. That was over that was, well, mm, 50 years ago. Wow. Over 50 years ago. The only satisfaction we should ever have is a dissatisfied satisfaction. But I want to add to that, because that was a powerful thing. You know what that told me? Just keep going forward. Just keep doing more. Do more. Do more. Do more. Learn more. But I have a question to put with this. You might feel pretty satisfied today where you are. And I hope that there is a level of, I'd rather you have some level of satisfaction with your walk than none. But to never think there's not more is not good either. And so I would have you ask yourself a question for thought. And that question is this. 
Is God satisfied with my satisfaction level? Is he satisfied? All right. Is he satisfied with the time I spend with him? Is he satisfied with the time I spend in the word? Is he satisfied with the way I serve? Is he satisfied the way I represent him? You know, we all can have a satisfaction level, but is it to the level that God has for us? You know what that's called? Growth. (laughs) It's called going further. It's called doing more. It's called learning more. It's called advancing into the kingdom. What we just read out of Peter, get that in you. Get Peter in you. Get that chapter in you. All right? So, biblically, it was always God's plan for us as Christians to continue to grow and not say status quo. Now, here, here's something I just want to inject. This is just an extra commercial in the message here. But over the years of 50 years now of ministry altogether, uh, I was in 48 active. Now I'm retired, but I'm refired because I'm right back in ministry. So another, add another couple more years. So 52 years or more, I've been in the ministry. And... Uh, uh, holding credentials with the Assemblies of God. So it's been a long time. And, and let me tell you three top things I've heard about Christians with their Bibles. And that's this. Number one, I don't know where to read, Pastor. Now, when a new convert come to see me, or I led them to the Lord, and, and I would tell them to read the Bible, I would understand when they would say, I'm not sure where to read the Bible. I would understand, that would make sense to me. And so I would guide them. Give them some tips on where to go. But when they're sitting in my office or I'm emailing, I do e-counseling, a lot of e-counseling, and when I'm counseling people and they've been a Christian for 10, 15, 20 years, and they said, I just don't know we're reading the Bible. You've just told me, you're not reading your Bible then. How can we know the Lord for so many years and we haven't read the Bible yet or enough? That's not good. Here's the second one. Well, I don't understand the Bible. Well, I know one way to learn how to understand the Bible. Read it. Read it. Oh, and here's number three. Believe it or not, here's number three. I just don't have time for devotions. Really? Do you read papers? Yeah. Do you read magazines? Yeah. Do you read books? Oh, yeah, I love to read, Pastor. I love to read. Uh, Is this in the library at home? Is this anywhere in sight, you know, as a reminder? Don't cover the home with the newspapers and books and magazines that you're reading. Make sure, listen, I have an OCD. You want to hear one of my OCDs? I let nothing ever sit on top of my Bible. Nothing sits on top of my Bible. I want to always be reminded of how important it is, why I should read it. And I made sure the Bible was out and open in our home so the kids saw that the most important book in our home was the Bible. And I'm telling you, when I carried my Bible to high school, I didn't carry my Bible like this. I carried my Bible like that. They knew what I stood for. Because I, I believe in this book. I trust this book. I, I thank God for it. And so we have time for TV. We have time to read those books. We got time to read the Bible. What is going on here? Well, I'm saved. I'm ready. So, see, there's a problem with the so-so attitude. There's, there's a problem with the just going along as life is. Never allowing God to challenge us. Never allowing God to do more. Never allowing God to reveal himself to us. Well, folks, we get that revelation through the reading of his word. So the answer is, read the word. Read the word. And do what it says. Now, in this message, let's let's look at what can affect spiritual growth in our lives. There's one that Jesus talked about, and uh, it was connected to spiritual growth in Revelation when he talked to the Ephesus church. You remember what he said? He said, uh, he praised them for good things, a hardworking church. He had no problem with them being a good church. But I have this one thing against you. You have lost your first love. Do you remember when you got saved, how exciting and fresh and clean and wonderful it was, and bouncing up and down, walking on cloud nine, 
And over time, things have just kind of come back down to earth. And, and, and some of that's normal because you really are excited to find Christ. That, that's nothing wrong with that. That's wonderful. But sometimes we let so many things in this world distract us and keep us from that we find ourselves kind of just going along. Oh, honey, we got to get to church. We're running a little late. Let's get going. That's going along. But behind the scenes and, and deep within our being and soul, is there this energy and excitement to want to do more, no more for God? Is it there anymore? That's, that's what he was saying. You, you've lost your first love. And I think he was also, I think Jesus might have also been implying that personal time with him. I, I think that has to be included. And he was saying, you've lost that. So, um, well, let's... let's Let's look at number two. Now, number two uh, might sting a little bit. I don't want to make anybody feel this way, but it could be that not mentally, not physically, et cetera, because we have mind to do everything else. We have energy to do everything else under the sun and go shopping, do this, do that. So we can't say it's that, but I think we have developed over the years what I call a spiritual laziness. We've become spiritually lazy. In other words, we make sure that the physical is intact. We make sure that our mind's intact. We make sure that all, everything else in life has to be done, which we have our dailies in life they have to do. They have to be done. Got to cut the grass. You got to go shopping. You got to take care of the kids. You got to cook. Da -da 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 -da. We got to do all that stuff. But we, in all of that, we've become spiritually lazy, and we haven't stopped long enough to take time to be in that deep moment in time. Remember when Jesus was talking to Mary and Martha? He wasn't saying that Martha was wrong to be preparing. What he was really trying to say was that, but that at that time, Mary was doing the better thing. She was doing the better thing. She was taking a break from all that stuff and just spending time with him. And folks, we got to get to the place in our lives where we just stop everything and we're spending some time with the Lord. We're spending time with the Lord. I'll never forget the professor at Bible school who told us a story one night. He says, you know, God, for years, the Lord would always wake him up to pray. He said, I don't know why, class, but he would wake me up in the middle of the night to pray all the time. So there I am, praying in the middle of the night. Because he, he'd come to class tired. He would. He'd look tired. And, but he said, the Lord woke me up in class when I was praying for da-da-da. He said, one night, he told the Lord, he said, Lord, you know what? I've had it. I'm not going to pray for anything. Now, you know what I'm going to do tonight, Lord? He didn't say I've had it. That, because the Lord's the one that would wake him up. That's not what he was saying. I said that wrong. What he said was, Lord, tonight, I'm not going to pray. He woke up. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to sit with you. Lord, I just want to be with you. I just want to sit in your presence. I want to be with you. It's like he's wanting to, like he's wanting to encourage God or something. You know? While he's sitting there, this is a true story. While he's sitting there, if God can raise the dead, open the, the sea and shut the mouths of the lions, you'll have no problem believing this story. Amen? So he says, as I'm sitting there, he said, I feel this drop of water on my forehead. He looked out the window and it wasn't raining. No rain, no leaks. He said, class, I know why the Lord did that. A tear from his eye, he let me actually drop on my forehead to let me know he was thankful that I was sitting with him. Folks, God is always thankful and grateful. He's got feelings, you know, when we sit in his presence and just soak him in. You don't have to let your mind race. You don't have to be thinking about this. You don't have to be thinking about that. Just sitting in his presence. I like to do that on my back porch when the weather's nice. I like to do that on my back porch and just sit and absorb him. Practice that, church. It makes a difference. By the way, that's what helps us to grow. So either we live with these battles that we endure at times or because that's number three the battles that we have within not knowing how to handle those battles within so we just go along thinking we have to live this way think we have to live in our battles no we don't and we struggle to know how to defeat them let me read to you uh galatians out of galatians chapter five and uh, verse 16 and 17. Galatians 5, 16 and 17. So I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. 
For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They're going to battle all the time. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not, are not to do whatever you want. They are in conflict with each other so that... Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. Wait. So the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit was contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. You know, I can't walk out here today and just do what I want. I can't. Are you thinking you can? Are you thinking it's good to be at church? It is. Thank you. Thank you, online people. But do you think it's okay that I go out and just do as I want? Really? I don't think so, because if I do, there's going to be a what? Conflict in my spirit. Thank God for the conflict. If you didn't get a conflict, you may not know God. Be thankful for the conflict, for we're about to do something we shouldn't, because that means the conviction of the Holy Spirit is in me, which means Jesus must be in me, because if he ain't in me, there is no conviction. There's just freedom to do as I please. Well, honey, there ain't no freedom to do as you please in Christ. We have a responsibility. We have a responsibility, and we're accountable to this word. I was thinking back there before I came out this morning, I thought, Lord, I've been preaching for over 50 years now. And I still walk out here today in fear and trepidation because of the responsibility you've given me to preach the word. I still have that fear and trepidation. I just do. I have the fear of the Lord because this is his word I'm handling today and sharing with you. So look at this. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. So it's not the do's or the don'ts if we're led by the Spirit. That is so beautiful. Now, listen, let me, we need to look at something here. This scripture in verse 16 did not say, walk by the Spirit and you won't have the desires of the sinful nature. That's not what it said. It said, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. What does that mean, Pastor? What it means is there are going to be challenges. There are going to be battles. There are going to be things that can hinder you, that keep you growing. Do you know that if you're not feeling that struggle, if you're not feeling that conviction, if you're not feeling that conflict, let me tell you something. Then, and, you're, and, you, and you're, you say you're a Christian, then you know what? Satan's got you where he wants you because you ain't feeling anything. You just think it's okay to do as you please and be a Christian. Well, let me tell you something. You know who he's bothering? He's bothering the person who wants to grow. He's bothering the person who is in the spirit. He's bothering the person who wants to take a stand against him. That's the ones he's going to bother for sure. He's got the others where he wants them. They're not even paying attention to God. But those of you that are paying attention to God, he's going to come after you. He's going to come after you, folks. But he's only got so far he can go. And here comes the hand of God. And he puts up the wall and he blocks it off. And that's what this victory is about. If you're, and, and so it, it's, it's beautiful to, to see that going on. All right. So while we move along, it's clear that we have responsibility as we move along. OK. We are not to be negligent in our walk with the Lord. So if battles are going on inside, it's obvious that we have to do something about it. And uh, the how are we going to keep that grow going? And we've already talked a lot about it. Read Peter. Add these things to your walk. Did you think that when you got saved and you read a few scripture verses, you were done now? And now I can just sit and relax? Oh, honey, with what's coming around the corner, you will not be sitting and relaxing. You will not be sitting and relaxing. You will be up and about it. You will either claim God and stick your neck out for God and do what God says, or you're going to fall behind. Peter, he, he's talking about that. Read that chapter. Don't let that chapter slip your mind. We are not to be negligent in our walk. And I'm not implying that anybody sitting here today is intentionally going to walk out and say, yeah, yeah, okay, I'm just going to do it. I'm not saying that's what you're doing. But we could, we could be so distracted by stuff that we could become negligent with the things inside of us that God wants to deal with yet. We got, how will I know? 
If I don't take time to listen to the voice of God, folks, how will I know what God wants of me if I don't take time to listen to his word? Sometimes we just don't understand how to handle them. And, and, and so it's not that you're intentionally happy about battles. We're, whatever the reason we have a struggling, whatever the reason, in other words, we have struggling, a struggling walk rather than a victorious walk, then let's get something straight in our walk, all right? Number one, let's not be afraid of this. We are going to have battles. We are going to have that. Whatever shape and size they come, we're going to have some battles. We read that to you, all right? So let me just give you a test, a couple of little tests. Are you eager to get down to pray and you find it difficult to get up and go on? Or do you find it difficult to get down to pray and you can't wait to get up and you keep looking at your watch? That's a spiritual test. Here's another one. When going through something, am I falling apart or am I falling on God? Now, let me tell you something. I've known some pretty solid Christians over the years that would be walking with the Lord, doing good, and they'd be on a high. Something would happen, and all of a sudden, they have fallen apart. I mean, they're a mess. It's like the world has collapsed, and I'm thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. And, and, and then to have this come out of their mouth, where's God? Where's God in all this? Oh, ladies and gentlemen, let's just get one thing out of our head. Get it out of your dictionary, your Bible dictionary, Webster's dictionary, get it out of your head, don't, don't insult God like that and say, where are you, God? Now, listen, let me, let, me be, let me be careful here because you can innocently ask that question. I understand you. Lord, where are you in this? Here's a better way I think we should say it. And the reason why I'm saying it, because I'm a firm believer that God is an absolute. He's, he's everywhere at every day. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere at every time, all the time, past, present, and future. He's I'll never leave you nor forsake you. You need to claim the promises of God. He has not left you in a, in a battle. He's not disappeared. He, he's not being negligent. He is right there, my friends. Rather, here's what we should learn to say. is not say, God, uh, where are you? But say, God, wow, what are you up to now? What is it you want to do, Lord? You see, sometimes our battles have something for good. Something, all things work together for good. Hello, do you know your Bible? For all things work together for? It didn't say all good things work together for good. It said all things. For you. So it's even the, 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 the most uncomfortable battle I may be going through. There's something good that's going to have to come out of it. I have to trust God that he knows he's a sovereign God. He has a plan for our lives. He can do what he wants, when he wants, how he wants, through whom he wants, the way he wants. And so, ladies and gentlemen, never, ever, ever think that God is not there. You never have to question, where are you, God? He's there, honey. He's there, sir. He is right there with you. In fact, I got some better news than that. According to his word, he happens to be in us. And the deepest, most crucial, most hard, most hurtful battle you can imagine, he is still inside of you. You remember when the storm arose on the boat? And the disciples went and woke up Jesus. Now, I know Jesus had a sense of humor, and he probably fell asleep on purpose because he knew the storm was coming, and he wanted to see how the disciples reacted. Lord, Lord, don't you care that we perish? I can imagine he's chuckling inside. Of course, I have no clue. I'm just making that part up. I can imagine. I, I can say, yep, there you go, God. That's what we kind of thought might happen here. I'm in their boat. Ladies and gentlemen, if God's in your boat, if Jesus is in your life, honey, you ain't going to sink. I don't care what storm comes. I don't care what wind blows. I don't care how strong it rains. You can't sink when Jesus is in your life. We may be challenged. We may have to cry out to God, fall on God, but don't fall apart, honey, because as long as he's in your boat, you're not going to sink. And everyone said, amen. It's impossible. You can't sink a boat with Jesus in it. 
can't sink your life with Christ in it. So, to the extent of our reaction in a battle will be the extent of showing our spiritual strength where it lies. To the extent of our reaction in a, spirit, in a battle will be the extent of our spiritual strength. Will be the extent, will be, the, will be what's, how much spiritual strength we actually have. Now, this is the first circle of three circles. I'm sorry I didn't have the diagram. That's my bad. I, I didn't want to put our tech team on, on the spot the last minute. They are very busy people. This little small circle is the spirit. The next circle is our soul. The next circle is our body. And through the five senses is how stuff comes into our soul, into our spirit. So before I was saved, I had a word, two words in that circle that said old man, old nature, the old nature of the old man. In other words, the unconverted state. Now, in the next circle is the soul, which is the intellect, the will, and the emotion exists. And the intellect will, by the way, the spirit has intellect, will, and emotion, and, but the, the soul part, intellect, will, and emotion. And in that same circle is where sin, flesh, the self exist. So if there's going to be any sin, it's going to happen in the soul part that's been entered through the body part, the five senses, what we allow in, what we do, think, et cetera, et cetera, watch, whatever. So when Jesus came into my life, then the spirit, it's called, two more words are in there. It's called the new man is now in me. Jesus, the new man is in the spirit. That is, the Greek word for that is zoe, which means life, spirit. No spirit, no zoe, no life. You're in the grave somewhere. So then you have the soul part. And guess what? Nothing changed. You still have the intellect, the will, and the emotion, and you still have sin, flesh, and self, et cetera, where sin will occur. And when Galatians 5, 16, 17 said that the spirit wars against the flesh, the flesh against the spirit, that's where it happens. The spirit in us has been changed by Christ. It wars against the flesh, against the sin and the temptations of, of the flesh and nature that come in through the body. And so that's the battle that he's talking about as a descriptive measure. So here's what it says, and here's what it's saying. If you look at 16 and 17 of Galatians 5 very carefully, it is saying this, the one I feed the most is the one that will dominate me the most. Did you understand that? So if I feed the flesh the most, then the flesh will respond that way. That will become its behavior. If I feed the spirit, how do I do that, pastor? Obedience, reading the word, praying, studying, serving, just obeying God, doing what God says. Then spiritual responses will come from within me so that I will not be gratifying the desires of the fleshly nature that will keep attacking me. You walk out of this door today, honey, you may not even get out the door and you could be being attacked in your mind from Satan. You, you can. You, you, before you walk out these doors, Satan could be attacking you. You aren't going to believe that stuff today, are you? Come on, man. You aren't going to believe that, are you? And you know what you're going to say to him? Shut up. Yes, I am. You just, you know, I'm not one for talking to the devil. I let God do that part. I, I, I spend my time talking to God. But yeah, there comes a time to say, get thee behind me, Satan. There's, you have to learn to do that too. Now, uh, you know what? I, I got to share this with you. My, I, this came up this morning. It wasn't in the message originally, but we need to learn how to be practical with feeding the Spirit. When we were growing up, if, if, if we were sick and didn't feel well, my, my parents would, the first thing they would always pray for us. If, if it came church time and a Sunday night, and if some, one of us wasn't feeling, we always go to church on Sunday nights. Very some did we miss. Uh, our parents would either themselves or haul us down to the altar and eat it with oil. That's just how we did it. My parents always, always turned to prayer 
and anointing be anointed with oil before any medicine went in our bodies. That was their first thing. When I had a bad case of strep throat here, so bad on a Sunday morning years ago, and I had no help in the church, we were still small, but it was in the new building next door at that time. Uh, I, I had to preach Sunday night. I had no money to preach for me. I had to go back to her Sunday night. Well, that Sunday morning, I went to see the doctor. We prayed. Don't get me wrong. We prayed and everything. I said, I, I, I got to preach today. He brought me in his office before I went to church service that morning. And he helped me with some, uh, some meds, but how fast did they work? You know, I, that, I have to preach the morning. I preach tonight. This is, this is how I'm preaching Sunday night. Bless their hearts. I don't know how they heard anything I said. And they, they prayed for me. I went home. I called my parents. I went to what I knew was a practice in our home growing up. I said, Mom, Dad, I've got so much pain. I, I can barely, I can't eat. I can't even eat. I can't swallow. It's so painful. I need you to pray. Well, my mom and dad got on that phone, and they were just a praying in, in the Holy Spirit and tongues. Prayed up a storm. Hung up the phone. This is a true story. The first swallow I made, the pain was completely gone. I, I didn't. And you know what? My wife was there cooking the supper for the kids. I got to eat. That was what was also cool. I could actually finally eat. No more pain. Not had bronchitis since. I give God the glory and praise and honor for that. You know what that is? That's the spirit feeding the spirit. By the way, I have a suggestion for you. I'm not against medicine. I'm just saying God should be first. Give him a chance. Let him do what he wants. Let him work in his life what he's working. Let, he's, he's got a bigger plan more than we can see. So I know I got to hurry, don't I? I got to hurry, don't I? So listen, get yourself a bottle of oil. Put it in the cabinet with the side of the medicine. Aspirin, da 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 da. Ah, oil. Reach for the oil. Anoint your kids. Anoint yourself. Anoint your spouse. Anoint your dog and cat. Do what you got to do. Go to God first. Feed the Spirit first, folks. Feed the Spirit first. Again, don't say where God is. Where are you, God? Say, God, what are you going to do next? What are you going to do next, Lord? Lord, I'll be honest with you, I don't like what I'm going through, but God, I know you've got something good. All things work together for good. Well, folks, listen. Christianity, it is work. It is work. And I trust that one of the most beautiful things you can see in Galatians chapter 5 again, it's interesting. In verse 16, it said, walk by the Spirit. In verse 18, it says, and you'll be led by the Spirit. And then in verse 25 says, keep step with the Spirit. Now look at this. So if I'm walking in the Spirit, I will be able to be led by the Spirit because I'm walking in the Spirit. I will hear him follow his leading. Now, as a result, I'm actually keeping this step with the Spirit. Isn't that beautiful? Walk in the Spirit, you'll be led by the Spirit. As you're led by the Spirit, You'll be keeping a step with the Spirit. Now, keep a step with the Spirit means that you're being led by the Spirit, which means you're walking in the Spirit. Honey, now that's feeding the Spirit. That's letting the Spirit dominate your life. If you walk and are led and keep a step with the Spirit, He will dominate you. He will control you. He will help you. He will be there. He'll get you through those difficult battles and help you to walk in victory. So I close with this. We are not to just cruise along we are to be victorious. That is the plan of God for your life. I can tell you that right now. If you walked in here today, 50 of you say, what is God's plan? I can tell you right now, walk in victory. And that means you're going to have to get into the Word and study all of that, which brings us to that point. Read God's Word. Feed yourself on God's Word. To feed yourself on God's Word is to feed the Spirit in you. Do what it says. Fall on God in times of trouble, not apart he will never leave us nor forsake us. All right? And then, as Peter said, participate. I love that. Participate in his divine nature, in the divine nature of Christ. And if we'll do that, we'll walk in victory. So, we close with this thought. 
You're in bow, going about your business one day and you hear a knock at your heart's door. You go to the door and there stands Satan. Your old landlord. Remember the old nature? He was your landlord. But now you have a new nature, a new man. He's your new landlord. And so you open the door and he says, hey, you owe me. You owe me. I've been your landlord for years. You owe me. And you say, hmm, wait just a moment. Lord, now what am I doing? I'm being hit with a tremendous temptation. Am I falling apart? No, I'm going to fall on God. God, you're my new landlord. And right now I'm really being tested. I'm being led to believe I owe this world. I owe my past. I owe Satan. I owe the things of this world. And Lord, I'm going to just fall upon your wisdom. I'm just going to trust you, Lord, to do me a big favor. I want you to go talk to him. So you go back to the door and say, uh, listen, old landlord, I, I've got a new landlord, and he's going to come and talk to you. And you send God out there. And you shut the door and let God take care of him because he's your new landlord, and you go on about your business. You go on walking in victory because you turn it over to the Lord. Listen, those of you that are going through things with people, turn them over to the Lord. I got, I got to say this. Then I promise to pray. I promise to pray. We, we dedicated our three children when they were born. And uh, I would dedicate them right off the bat. We didn't even wait till we got to a church service. I dedicated them right off the bat. And, uh, when, you know, we, I was there for the birth of all three of our kids. And it was a great experience. I looked like a giant green pepper walking through the hospital with this outfit they put me in. They, they couldn't find one big enough for me, so I looked like a giant green pepper. It was so funny. Uh, Dr. Kuhn, Dr. Kuhn, calling Dr. Kuhn. So, uh, you know what we did? We turned our kids over to the Lord. And the day they left our home, you know what we did? We leaned back on the history of what we did with our kids. And we just remembered that we gave them to the Lord so that when they were out of our sight, they were not out of God's sight. So that dedication we took seriously. Listen, dedicate yourselves, dedicate your family, dedicate your kids, whoever you need to. Leave it in the hands. Do what you can do if you're allowed to do it, but you leave them in the hands of God because God is still there for them as well. And all three of our kids, they serve the Lord and love the Lord and are involved in some kind of ministry. Give it to the Lord. Give it to the new landlord. Feed the new landlord. Not that he needs it, but because we need it. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Father in heaven today, we just thank you for your word to remind us that we're not to be walking in a status quo. We're not to be walking in a so-so, just going along with life as it is. Oh, there's so much more for us. There's actually an active life, victorious walk in life for us. And Father, on the line today, there might be those listening who say, I don't even know the Lord personally or here today. I don't know him personally. I don't have the new landlord in my life. Father, I just pray that they'll pray a simple prayer and right now do that. Lord, I open my heart to you. I want you to be my new landlord in my life. I'm tired of the old landlord and what is happening in my life. And I want more. I want to know you. So, Jesus... I ask you to forgive me of my sins, my shortcomings, my failures, and I invite you into my heart by faith that you will change me. And I, by faith, accept you as my Lord and my Savior. Help me, Lord, as I start a new journey, a new journey with you in my heart. Father, we just pray for these folks and, and for others today who admit that uh, their life has been more status quo than really experiencing the fullness of your spirit. Lord, 
we're, I've not been increasing. I've just been maintaining. I need to increase without measure. I need to increase my walk with you. So, Lord, I, I offer my heart to you. And I will add these things to my life and I will work at these things and I will believe you, trust you and I will not fall apart, but I'll fall upon you and I will not question where are you? I will question what do you have in store, Lord? Because I know all things work together for good. And that sometime, Lord, Lord, can be a hard concept, but it's biblical and it's true. It really is true. So Lord, bless this congregation. Bless them, strengthen them mightily by the power of your spirit. May they enjoy their walk with you. And know that you will always, always be there. And let us not settle for anything less than what you have. I don't want to be an ordinary Christian. I want to be an extraordinary Christian. So, Lord, undertake. Bless these people. Watch over them. Give them a wonderful week. Help us to make a difference for you in the kingdom. Again, be with all the retreat people coming back home. We give you glory, praise, and honor. And all God's people prayed in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. We love you. Thank you for the privilege.